optimism, pessimism question, um, and about you know what, what you see that's making you hopeful now, what you see, or whether you see much that's making you hopeful, and sort of both a that's a national or domestic question and an international one, because I could use a little domestic. Inspiration, if you have any. Really, for domestic hope in particular. In particular, I am empty in the domestic hope Did category. I, mention, I actually came to Wisconsin, you know, looking, looking for <laughs> domestic hope. So, if I'm somehow being asked to be a messenger for this, we've got we've got a bigger problem than we thought. The uh, head organizer for Acorn Canada's woman, Judy Duncan, I've worked with for the last you know eight or eight years in Canada, nine, ten years. She was on the Acorn staff in Seattle as an expat. You know, whenever we're having a staff meeting, she'll warn me, now wait, no Debbie Downer here. <laughs> you know, so she edits me aggressively on the long term optimism, pessimism uh, equations. I've asked the wrong person. <laughs> no, you, I mean, I, no, you can't do this work without being eternally optimistic. That, you know, I really still believe that, you know, the arc of justice runs our way, that victory is as inevitable as the, part, as the setting of the sun, as. Uh, Eugene Debs argued uh, so eloquently years ago. So, I mean, the, our cause is just. So victory is, is, you know, maybe not something I'm going to see, but something that we're going to have. And I think that that is borne out over and over again. So in the big, big terms, I don't know necessarily how to get there from here in every case, but I think it's uh, undeniable that we, you know, have to win. And I believe, and you know, part of why I get up and can do this work over you know, forty plus years is that there is a huge value in struggle. People desperately, you know, I used to tell people when they were paying dues to Acorn, hey, let's be clear, and this is the same thing I say in unions. You're really only paying dues for the right to fight. Do you think there's something else coming with this? I mean, your dues. I don't care if it's a hundred dollars a month as a teacher, or you know, ten dollars a month when you're paying for you know Acorn Canada. You get the right to fight. You get the right to raise your hand and make a decision on what that fight's going to be and how you're going to conduct that fight. But after that, there's no guarantees. It is a fight. And if some, let me have your mother call me if you got the wrong word coming up, and I'll help her with this. But you know, it's a fight, and we have to be ready for that. And I think that's, in some ways, I think that's. Uh, and I, you know, I don't want to be unfair, because I worked with these people for decades. But I think one of the things that was what dismoored uh, the Acorn leadership, uh, as they saw so many of what they thought were friends and allies desert them when they were under attack, is they really thought someone else would come to the fight with them. You know, there's that old joke about you know, justice and just us. I mean, it, <laughs> it really is. Just us. I mean, you better you have better have a base that you can go back to, and I think that's what Cecile Richards proved with Planned Parenthood that yeah. tactics have to serve strategy, and as a membership organization, you have to be willing to go to your base. And if you can't go to your base or not willing to, you shouldn't shouldn't take the job running the organization. And there are risks. You'll either respond or not respond. You'll win or lose. I mean, that was. Uh, you know, the original separation between ACORN and many of our brothers and sisters who we learned from and greatly respected in community organizing was our willingness to be involved in electoral politics, which was certainly anathema to Alinsky in every way, shape, and form, because we thought it was important. I mean, our members wanted to win. I mean, you couldn't win if you weren't going to contest for power. How do you talk about power in a way that people understand if they understand power as being political and then say, but you can't be involved in politics? I mean, I'm just not that good, and, and I'm good, but I could never convince any member of ours that politics was somehow not part of the electoral system in the United States and so many other places. So if you're not, so from 1972 on, we were involved in elections. ACORN was never tax exempt. It was nonprofit. We never made a cent. I can guarantee that. Um, <laughs> but it was never nonprofit. There was no special tax exemption you got. I mean, so. There was never a point where I wanted to be in a position where I had to say to a membership paying dues and a democratically elected organization, oh, you, you can't do that. You see, you can't do that because that would be a problem with our funding. I mean, you're telling people who are paying dues somehow that they can't do something with their, this is their organization, but you can't do this? I mean, um, 
you know, one of the most incredible organizing experiences that, you know, contradictions ever was uh, when I heard about in Los Angeles where there's a joint meeting of unions and UNO, which was, you know, run by Ernie Cortez at that time with the IAF, which is a Alinsky successor organization. And uh, some of the speakers started talking about an upcoming mayorality election. And Ernie literally ran up and jumped on the stage and tried to take the microphone to somebody yelling at the top of his voice over and over again, UNO's a 501c3, UNO's a 501c3, we can't be here. Well, I mean, I felt like, well, finally, what I feared all my life that I was never going to do, I just, you know, Ernie Cortez is a great organizer. But all of a sudden, I don't know what could have possessed him, but there he was, caught in my nightmare. And I thought, oh, thank God, that's one mistake I never made. <laughs> <laughs> Besides yeah, yeah, yeah. not jumping on the stage and, you know, acting a fool. Um, but, I mean, I think this is the problem. I mean, you can't, uh, if, you're, if we're willing to trust people enough to build organization, we have to be willing to believe that they can win and that they're able to fight. And so the notion that somehow as organizers or as outsiders in the community, there's some special privileged set of information and skills and knowledge we have that people can't handle in making decisions about how to fight, that's just wrong. And our best skills are in listening. And luckily for me, and I would challenge any of you, I've never been in a labor situation or a community where in talking to people and listening to them, I can't find a history of struggle. I can't find a history of people having stood together to try to organize, even against great odds, even at risk of their jobs and homes, even at, for so many other reasons, they, even where the only concerted activity was going to be two or three of them on a block or two or three of them, five or six of them on a shipping dock or whatever it was, there's always a story people can tell you Sometimes it's not a good story. It's a story that's moral is, and that's how they lost their jobs and why I won't organize a union. But there's always a story of struggle in every neighborhood. And part of what I've always seen as my job is listening carefully enough to find that struggle so that I could sit, I could sit the ACORN experience or the community organizing experience in a history that they already appreciated and knew from their own life. And that's part of what I was doing, was trying to translate their own experience back to them through an organizational prism that allowed them to at least make a decision on whether or not they wanted to take action and participate and try to make something different. And if I couldn't do that, well, there's no special secret knowledge I had. Could you?